Can I do my own wiring for my house extension? You don't need an electrician to lay your cables and you'll not only save a fortune by doing it yourself, you'll be able to progress with the project without waiting for them to turn up. Now in a previous video I showed you how I plan out the electrical wiring using the drawings and plans I already have and the link for that is above. And I'll use these drawings where I've sketched on the lines of where my cable will run and I'm thinking ahead to the construction and imagining where I will be able to clip the cable runs. So I'll begin to think about the cable runs less as a diagram and more of a 3D reality. And the easiest way to do this is just to walk around the job once the framing and walls are being completed and figure out your routes. I'll take photos and sketch over the routes sometimes like I'm doing here for this attic conversion and sometimes I'll use a 3D drawing although I won't always have them and neither will you of course. Photographs are absolutely fine. Things I'll think about is is there a service void? Is it block work or timber? Should I go through the ceilings and drop down to each socket? Or should I just run through the walls or around the walls and so on? For each project it really just depends and there's no right or wrong answer. You're just trying to choose the most efficient and optimal route. First I need to buy my materials. I'll go for 100 metre roll of 2.5 twin and earth for my ring main. 100 metre roll of 1 millimetre twin and earth for my lighting circuit and switching. 125 metre roll of 1.5 millimetre twin and earth for my dedicated boiler supply radio. 125 metre roll of 10 millimetre twin and earth for my induction hob radial and my cooker radial. 150 metre roll of 3 quart twin and earth for my two way lighting and my smoke detection. Cable clips for each of the thicknesses of the cable I've just mentioned. And for my induction and cooker sockets, I'll buy deep 44 millimetre metal back boxes to take account of the thick cable which need more space. I'll use drywall boxes for the rest of the sockets although I won't fix them until after the plasterboard goes on and I'll buy some rubber grommets to protect the cable as it passes through the metal back box. There's a couple of tools, some cable snips and a hammer for the cable clips and that's my shopping list for my first fix electrics. You can see how it's a relatively small amount in the scheme of costs for your build projects. And see my other video with more detail about this pricing spreadsheet if you want to have a look at that. The time to start clipping the cable runs in place is when the floor, walls and roof structures are up and the insulation is in but before any plasterboard sheeting has started. Here it is on my programme of work that uh, I guessed at the start of the project. And this is an efficient and intuitive way to plan your labour and your programming since my mind at least works way better when I can think and see graphically and get an overview of the thing that I am doing. Now I mentioned insulation, it's very important not to have any cabling completely covered or sandwiched by your insulation to avoid any potential overheating issues. So you do need to get your insulation in before you start your cabling. Tips on running cables. I'll screw a temporary batten at an angle to the wall and hang the cable drum onto it, which when you're alone, makes it possible to pull long runs the cable out efficiently from the drum without the cable twisting. Once you've twisted the cable, and it is a rookie error, because of the memory of the copper inside the rubber insulation, it's impossible to straighten it, meaning it's much harder to clip, and the whole thing, believe me, becomes a more painful affair. We'll run the cables, clipping the cables in horizontal and vertical runs, using the right size of cable clips for the particular cable size per our earlier shopping list. Always lining the cable runs up with the sockets and fixtures whilst running them vertically or horizontally, keeping to what we call safe zones. Now, although these safe zone wiring regulations are no longer compulsory if you're using modern circuit protection such as RCBOs, and I'm sure I'll get to that at some point, it's still really good practice and common sense actually to keep to these guidelines. The logic behind safe zones is that if you wanted to hang some pictures on the wall, for example, you're going to notice the switch or socket on your particular wall and know that anywhere along these zones is a possibility of going through the cable within the wall with a nail or screw. So you'll position your shelves or pictures elsewhere. If I want to turn a corner with my cables, I'll press the cable against the wall and gently 
slow radius bend it around using my fingers and again I'll make sure the change of direction happens in a socket safe zone. Running cable is actually harder than it looks so give yourself time, prepare well and give it some love. In this extension it's timber framed so I'm just running the cables through the framing service void we've created and nailing the clips onto battens. I'll be using dry wall boxes which I'll position after the plasterboard is fixed. If you have block work walls and your full coat plastering I'll first fix 25mm metal back boxes for my socket into the wall where I want the sockets, chasing them into the block work with a grinder and a hammer drill. Then I'll drill holes along the length of the runs where I want each cable clip and push a dowel into each hole and then I'll have a little bit of timber to enable me to tap the cable tack into the wall. If you don't fix your back boxes first in these scenarios it really is much harder to run the cables if you're inexperienced. Now if I'm dot dabbing plasterboard onto the block work then it is a little bit easier. I'll fix 6mm ply strips along their lengths with 5mm roll plugs where my runs are in order to fix the cables with cable clips. I'll mark on the plasterboard where the dangling cables are immediately as I glue each board and I'll use dry wall boxes cutting holes in the sheet to suit. You can't use this method with full coat plaster of course as the ply will suck the moisture out of the plaster as it cures. Now although I'm not worrying about wiring the individual sockets and switches at this point, where I cut my cables as they terminate at a socket or switch I'm remembering to leave them long. I'll usually go around 300 millimeters before the drywall box is in or where I have metal boxes it will be 150 millimeters. That's a good length short enough to tuck and fold neatly into the back box and avoid it getting covered in plaster long enough to wire into the terminals once you get your boxes in. With my wiring complete I'll go ahead and plasterboard over the whole place but before getting it plastered I'll either get my fluke out to check for continuity and insulation to make sure there's no breaks or nicks in the cable or I'll get my electrician to do this as part of his first test to make sure everything is okay and I want to do this before going ahead with the skim coat. If there's an issue for whatever reason it's really easy to unscrew a sheet of plasterboard and do any repairs not so once it's skimmed of course. Now I've made a whole load of videos on coordinated plasterboard including how to make perfect cuts for back boxes so check those out. Now I guess we'll also have to think about the final bits and pieces like smoke and heat detection, earthing along with running back to our consumer unit and what are the circuit protectors for this type of project but I'll cover those in the next one. Meantime please hit me a like it really helps me subscribe for more and see you the next time.